Chapter Six of John Stuart Mill: His Life and Works. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. John Stuart Mill: His Life and Works. His Work in Philosophy, by J. H. Levy. To a savage contemplating a railway train in motion, the engine would present itself as the master of the situation, the determining cause of the motion and direction of the train. It visibly takes the lead. It looks big and important, and it makes a great noise. Even people a long way up in the scale of civilization are in the habit of taking these attributes, perhaps not as the essential ones of leadership, but at all events as those by which a leader may be recognized. Still, that blustering machine, which puffs and snorts and drags a vast multitude in its wake, is moving along a track determined by a man hidden away from the public gaze. A line of rail lies separated from an adjacent one, the pointsman moves a handle, and the foaming giant that would, it may be, have sped on to his destruction and that of the passive crew who follow in his rear, is shunted to another line running in a different direction, and to a more desirable goal. The great intellectual pointsman of our age, the man who has done more than any other of this generation to give direction to the thought of his contemporaries, has passed away and we are left to measure the loss to humanity by the result of his labours. Mr. Mill's achievements in both branches of philosophy are such as to give him the foremost place in either. Whether we regard him as an expounder of the philosophy of mind, or the philosophy of society, he is facile princeps. Still it is his work in mental science which will, in our opinion, be in future looked upon as his great contribution to the progress of thought. His work on political economy not only put into thorough repair the structure raised by Adam Smith, Malthus, and Ricardo, but raised it at least one story higher. His inestimable system of logic was a revolution. It hardly needs, of course, to be said that he owed much to his predecessors, that he borrowed from Whewell much of his classification, from Brown the chief lines of his theory of causation, from Sir John Herschel the main principles of the inductive methods. Those who think this a disparagement of his work must have very little conception of the mass of original thought that still remains to Mr. Mill's credit. The great critical power that could gather valuable truths from so many discordant sources, and the wonderful synthetic ability required to weld these and his own contributions into one organic whole. When Mr. Mill commenced his labors, the only logic recognized was the syllogistic, Reasoning consisted solely, according to the then dominant school, in deducing from general propositions other propositions less general. It was even asserted, confidently, that nothing more was to be expected, than an inductive logic was impossible. This conception of logical science necessitated some general propositions to start with, and these general propositions, being ex hypothesi, incapable of being proved from other propositions, it followed that, if they were known to us at all, they must be original data of consciousness. Here was a perfect paradise of question-begging. The ultimate major premise in every argument being assumed, it could of course be fashioned according to the particular conclusion it was called in to prove. Thus an artificial ignorance, as Locke calls it, was produced, which had the effect of sanctifying prejudice by recognizing so-called necessities of thought as the only bases of reasoning. It is true that outside of the logic of the schools great advances had been made in the rules of scientific investigation. But these rules were not only imperfect in themselves, but their connection with the law of causation was but imperfectly realized, and their true relation to syllogism hardly dreamt of. Mr. Mill altered all this. He demonstrated that the general type of reasoning is neither from generals to particulars, nor from particulars to generals, but from particulars to particulars. If from our experience of John, Thomas, etc., who once were living, but are now dead, we are entitled to conclude that all human beings are mortal, we might surely, without any logical inconsequence, have concluded at once from those instances that the Duke of Wellington is mortal. The mortality of John, Thomas, and others is, after all, the whole evidence we have for the mortality of the Duke of Wellington. Not one iota is added to the proof by interpolating a general proposition. 
We not only may, according to Mr. Mill, reason from some particular instances to others, but we frequently do so. As, however, the instances which are sufficient to prove one fresh instance must be sufficient to prove a general proposition, it is most convenient to at once infer that general proposition, which then becomes a formula according to which, but not from which, any number of particular inferences may be made. The work of deduction is the interpretation of these formulas, and therefore, strictly speaking, is not inferential at all. The real inference was accomplished when the universal proposition was arrived at. It will be easily seen that this explanation of the deductive process completely turns the tables on the transcendental school. All reasoning is shown to be at bottom inductive. Inductions and their interpretation make up the whole of logic, and to induction accordingly Mr. Mill devoted his chief attention. For the first time induction was treated as the opus magnum of logic, and the fundamental principles of science traced to their inductive origin. It was this, taken with his theory of the syllogism, which worked the great change. Both his system of logic and his examination of Sir William Hamilton's philosophy are for the most part devoted to fortifying this position, and demolishing the beliefs inconsistent with it. As a systematic psychologist, Mr. Mill has not done so much as either Professor Bain or Mr. Herbert Spencer. The perfection of his method, its application, and the uprooting of prejudices which stood in its way, this was the task to which Mr. Mill applied himself, with an ability and success rarely matched and never surpassed. The biggest lion in the path was the doctrine of so-called necessary truth. This doctrine was especially obnoxious to him, as it set up a purely subjective standard of truth, and a standard, as he was easily able to show, varying according to the psychological history of the individual. Such thinkers as Dr. Whewell and Mr. Herbert Spencer had to be met in intellectual combat. Dr. Whewell held not that the inconceivability of the contradictory of a proposition is a proof of its truth co-equal with experience, but that its value transcends experience. Experience may tell us what is but it is by the impossibility of conceiving it otherwise that we know it must be. Mr. Herbert Spencer, too, holds that propositions whose negation is inconceivable have a higher warrant than any other whatever. It is through this door that ontological belief was supposed to enter. Things in themselves were to be believed in because we could not help it. Modern noumenalists agree that we can know nothing more of things in themselves than their existence, but this they continue to assert with a vehemence only equalled by its want of meaning. In his examination of Sir William Hamilton's philosophy, Mr. Mill gives battle to this mode of thought. After reviewing, in an opening chapter, the various views which have been held respecting the relativity of human knowledge, and stating his own doctrine, he proceeds to judge by this standard the philosophy of the absolute and Sir William Hamilton's relation to it. The argument is really on the question whether we have or have not an intuition of God, though, as Mr. Mill says, the name of God is veiled under two extremely abstract phrases, the infinite and the absolute. So profound and friendly a thinker as the late Mr. Grote held this raising of the veil inexpedient, but he proved, by a mistake he fell into, the necessity of looking at the matter in the concrete. He acknowledged the force of Mr. Mill's argument that the infinite must include a farrago of contradictions. But so also, he said, does the finite. Now undoubtedly finite things, taken distributively, have contradictory attributes, but not as a class. Still less is there any one individual thing, the finite, in which these contradictory attributes inhere. But it was against a corresponding being, the infinite, that Mr. Mill was arguing. It is this that he calls a fasciculus of contradictions, and regarded as the reductio ad absurdicium of the transcendental philosophy. Mr. Mill's religious tendencies may very well be gathered from a passage in his review of Auguste Comte, a philosopher with whom he agreed on all points save those which are specially Mr. Comte's. Candid persons of all creeds may be willing to admit that if a person has an ideal object, his attachment and sense of duty towards which are able to control and discipline all his other sentiments and propensities, and prescribe to him a rule of life, that person has a religion. 
and though every one naturally prefers his own religion to any other, all must admit that if the object of his attachment, and of this feeling of duty, is the aggregate of our fellow-creatures, this religion of the infidel cannot in honesty and conscience be called an intrinsically bad one. Many indeed may be unable to believe that this object is capable of gathering round it feelings sufficiently strong. But this is exactly the point on which a doubt can hardly remain in an intelligent reader of M. Comte, and we join with him in contemning as equally irrational and mean the conception of human nature as incapable of giving its love, and devoting its existence, to any object which cannot afford, in exchange, an eternity of personal enjoyment. Never has the libel of humanity involved in the current theology been more forcibly pointed out, with its constant appeal to low motives of personal gain, or still lower motives of personal fear. Never has the religious sentiment which must take the place of the present awe of the unknown been more clearly indicated. It is this noble sentiment which shines out from every page of Mr. Mill's writings, and all his relations to his fellow-creatures. The very birds about his dwelling seemed to recognize it. It is this noble sentiment which infuses a soul of life into his teachings, and the enunciation and acting out of which constitute him, not only the great philosopher, but also the great prophet of our time. End of chapter 6 Recording by Bill Borst